Thank you for joining us this week for Live Words. As you may be aware, we are looking at the Christian home. Um, for the first two weeks, we have looked at the Trinity as a model for the Christian home. And um, this week, we want to talk about marriage as, as the foundation of the Christian home. Um, we cannot talk about um, the Christian home without you know, discussing a bit about um, marriage. And so I want to take this time to this delve deep into God's design for marriage and, and all that. We'll begin by talking about a bit of history. We'll look at the trajectory that the institution of uh, marriage has traveled um, in human history and what people used to think about it then and what people used to think about it now and how it's being practiced now, and God's design and God's structure for, for marriage. Um, and so that's what we are going to concern ourselves with this week. But uh, I want to express some, some sentiments. I'm beginning to think that beyond the police, and I'm not talking about the Ghana police service, uh, the police as, as, a, um, as an institution worldwide, Beyond that institution, I'm beginning to think that um, marriage is 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 losing its appeal. Uh, not many people are extremely enthused um, about marriage. People are not interested in marriage. Um, it's just like um, the police. People uh, speak about marriage in such unsavory terms in, in the public square nowadays uh, but believe it or not at a certain point in human history there was some universal belief about the desirability and goodness uh, of marriage there was some consensus uh, about the form and function of marriage um, people believed that Marriage was between a man and a woman, and its function was for procreation and for raising responsible citizens for the world. This used to be uh, universal um, some time ago. Again, most religious uh, groups taught the same about marriage, its form and function, that the purpose of marriage was to create a framework for a lifelong devotion and love between a an husband and, and wife. Irrespective of your um, faith tradition, all tradition taught the same about marriage. That marriage created the only kind of social stability in which children could grow and thrive. This belief was, was universal. However, Beginning in the, 19, in the 18th and 19th um, century, a new perspective of marriage emerged. During this period, that's the period that is usually referred to as the Enlightenment, where um, science and, and, um, and um, reason displays faith and revelation as, as sources of uh, knowledge. This is the period that we are discovery at this time the meaning and the essence of life the meaning and the essence of marriage began to be redefined marriage began to be um, misunderstood if if for for the went of a better word the meaning and essence of life shifted from self-denial or truism being committed to relationships like marriage and family during this period, these ideals and values changed. The meaning of life began to be seen as the fruit of freedom, of individualism, 
to choose the life that most fulfills him or her personality. And so individualistic orientation to life emerged from this time. And that affected people's perception of marriage and people's orientation towards marriage. During this time, marriage was redefined as a means of finding emotional and sexual fulfillment and self-actualization. At this time, marriage was no longer seen as a spiritual institution or a social bond for the benefit of the human commonwealth. And so the, the we in marriage was taken out and replaced by the I. Marriage was no more um, an, an institution for two consenting um, covenantal people. Marriage was now um, an individual enterprise. From this period, from the um, 18th to the 19th century, marriage became more of a social contract, not a spiritual covenant. From this time, people married for themselves and not to fulfill responsibilities to God and society. And I want to suggest to many of us that the impression we have about marriage, the ori orientation we have towards marriage is more akin to the latter part than previous. We no longer, most people do not see marriage as universally desirable and of any good. Most people do not see marriage as a place where they owe a responsibility to God and society. From this time on, and this is the notion that is promoted on, uh, on the media. And so many young people growing up are forming such negative opinions and perceptions about marriage. And they are entering marriage with these same orientation. And I'm thinking that some of the challenges we are facing and experiencing in, in marriage is born out of this, this lie or these lies we have um, consumed about marriage from, um, from different sources. And so let's begin to go back to the source. Let's go back to God. Let's go back to his word. So we discover his intent, his design, and his plan for marriage. So that as we begin to think about it, as we begin to imagine how we want our marriage to be like, we will not found it based on the world's idea, the world's plan, and um, the world's intent, but we'll begin to found it on, on God's design, God's purpose, and God's plan. Unlike currently, where people think that marriage is, on, is not necessary, in God's eye, in God's mind, in God's design, marriage is good. It is of some benefit because in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God, from his own experience, saw the man and said, it is not good that the man should be alone. In other words, a solitary life does not amount to much, does not benefit much. And the wise man in Ecclesiastes said so, that two is better than one. Why? Because they get a reward for their labor. What, what's the, uh, the labor? Let me, I want to really get to the essence of what the wise man said in Ecclesiastes. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I think. Verses 9 to 12. Yes. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. The wise man is concurring with God in his, in his observation in the life of the man. God says that it is not good for the man to be alone. The wise man is also saying that um, two are better than one. In other words, a communal life, life lived together with somebody, with a person, is preferable to 
a, a, a solitary lifestyle. His reason, the wise man, his reason is this, because they have a good reward for their toil. What is that reward? The reward is not money, it is not fame, it is not anything physical, because a wise man has described these things as vanity. And I don't think that God had the same thing in mind. Why? Verse 10, he says, For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. You know, for existential purposes, the wise man, inspired by God, realizes that the road of life is not always smooth. One person may outrun everybody, the weak on the path, and even gather all the spoils on the way and become rich than everybody. But he says that on the road of life, there are pits that one may fall into. One may fall. And when you have somebody along with you, you'll be able to pick yourself up from that pit, from that fall, from that fall. And that is why the solitary life is not the way to go. Beyond that, he says, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Not only is the road of life not smooth, he says, it can also be very cold and dark. It can also be lonely. And so when one has a companion, one is able to keep warm from, from the darkness of life, from, from, the, from the coldness of life, and from all the vicissitudes of life, the challenges that we experience in life. Having somebody to do life with, the wise man says, is rewarding. Verse 12, he says, And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. Not only is the road of life not smooth, not only can it get cold and dark, but he says there are a lot of enemies dotted along the way. There are a lot of challenges, people who seek to hurt us and destroy us. And so with two, with a companion, one is better off. One is better, well placed to overcome and to prevail more than one who is alone. And therefore, it is not good to be alone. And we must come to this agreement that it is not good for the man to be alone. However, this statement was made about a, a certain particular man, Adam. So this statement cannot be taken wholesale to mean that marriage is for everybody. Marriage is not for everybody. Marriage is for this type of man, this man who falls in this particular category. What are some of the characteristics of this man? First, Adam was old enough. Adam was not created a baby. He was created an adult. So that marriage is, it is not good for an, a matured adult person to be alone. This is the statement. Two, Adam had the presence of God. Adam lived in the garden, had, having um, unfettered access to God. He had a relationship with his maker. So it is not good for this male adult, adult who has God's presence, who has a relationship with God, to be alone. For, and so the reverse would mean that for a younger, immature person who has no relationship with God, has no, has, does not have the presence of God, it is good for that person to be alone. But the one to whom this statement applies is a matured adult person who has a relationship, has God's presence. Not only that, again, in the same Genesis, chapter 2, there is something that we read. 
when God made this statement that it is not good for the man to be alone, it is interesting the next thing that we read in verse 19. It says, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bed of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. What is the relationship of this activity with the former statement or the past statement? Again, and whatever the man called every creature, that was its name. The man gave names all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 19, the man that it is not good for him to be alone is being prepared for the mate that God is preparing for him. So not only was he matured, not only was, did he have the presence of God, God trained him to gain intelligence because it takes an intelligent being to name God's creator, God's creatures. And he did so, and he was successful. He showed intelligence, he showed leadership. And in doing so, he cultivated the skill of communication. Being an adult, a matured adult, having the presence of God, having intelligence, having leadership skills, and having communication skills is what is needed in a marital relationship. And for such a person, it is not good for him to be alone. For some men, it, they are better off being alone. Why? Because they don't have intelligence. And so they cannot raise, they cannot lead the home. They cannot raise responsible kids. They cannot, they cannot build a family. They are better off alone. But for such a man, Adam, as, as, as he was then, God realized that it was not good for him to be alone. But even from this statement, we realize God's purpose and God's design for marriage. And we'll come to it later on. But let's go to Genesis chapter 2. I think we are going to stay here for a while. Verse 20. Out of this statement and out of the preparation God made with the man, Adam, he says, verse 21, Verse 20, the man gave names all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God used, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up his, its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This alas is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall call, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And so out of the man's loneliness and solitude, God decided to make for him a help me. He, he wanted, he decided to make for him a helper suitable for him. That is the expression. Now, two things must be noted here. From the statement that God made, I'll make for him a helper sweet, suitable for him. We can learn from here that God's design of marriage suggests that marriage is between a man and a woman, and not a man and a man. The word translated suitable in the Hebrew is a combination of two words. The first part means against or unlike. 
And so the helper God made was against the man. In other words, anatomically, physiologically, the helper God made was different from the man. And so God did not intend marriage to be, be, to be, to be between the same sex. And so let's get that off um, uh, uh, the ground. Marriage was designed for the man and the helper that is different and against unlike him. So that's the first part. The second part is this, that the woman as the helper to the man does not connote inferiority. The woman that God created for the man is not inferior. He, she is not meant to be the man's servant. And so, those of us men who think that the fact that the woman is a help me, therefore it makes her a servant and a subordinate, that's not the case. Why? Because the animals God created are helpers to men. We are supposed to dominate them. But none of them is a helper corresponding to him. Animals are inferior to man, but not the woman. Why? Because the same word used to describe the woman as a helpmeet is also used in other parts of the Old Testament to describe God as a helper to man. In Psalm 46, there's... One. Let's let's read that. Psalm forty six. There's one. This is what the psalmist says. He says, "God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble." The word used here as help is the same word used as help meet for the woman. So if God helps man and does not and that does not make God inferior to man, then the woman being the helpmeet of man does not make the woman inferior to man. Rather, if God helps us, and if God is our refuge and strength, then God created the woman to function as him, like him, in the life of the man. When the woman is functioning as the helpmeet of the man, he, she is functioning like God in the life of the man. He becomes the, the strength of the man. He becomes the wisdom of the man. A woman who is truly fulfilling the role of a helpmeet is performing a godlike role, a godlike function in the life of a husband. She becomes his strength in times of trouble. She becomes his wisdom in times of difficulty. And so that these are the ways. And these are the basis upon which God designed marriage and provided the woman to help. And so, God designed marriage for companionship because he realized that it is not good for the man to be alone. Just like God did not exist alone, and God existed in community together with the Son and the Holy Spirit. God knew the essence, the value of companionship. Marriage is for companionship. It is also for sharing. That the man would have a companion to share his dreams, his aspirations, his fears, his hopes with. Somebody to support, somebody to encourage. So marriage is for companionship. It is 
for sharing it is for fellowship fellowship means to have something in common god intended for the man and the woman to have a lot of things in common life seeking god's presence pursuing god's creation mandate to to multiply and to be fruitful and to fill the earth so which will come to that suggests also that marriage is for procreation marriage is for companionship for for togetherness for sharing for for procreation it is for togetherness that the two of them together will fulfill God's mandate for, for them. Now, having talked about the design of marriage, let's talk about the structure. I've already hinted that the woman is not, was not meant to be inferior to the man. And so, in God's structure for their union, and she being a helper to the man, God intended for them to be equals in substance, in essence, and not in roles. Their roles differ, but they are the same in the sight of God. Now, Both the man and the woman receive the creation mandate. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 to 30. All of them were told to be fruitful and to multiply and to dominate and take caring responsibility for God's creation. And so on that score, all of them are equal in the sight of, of God. When Eve was brought, was created and brought to Adam, Adam's own poem suggests some level of equality. Adam recognized it as the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. Sorry. So if Eve is the bone of his bone, and Adam believes that his bone is not inferior. Why would he think that the same person that he made from his bone would be inferior to him? And so on that level, on that score, there is some level of e e equality. And please, don't, don't take me out of context. I'm not using equality in the context of what um, is, is parading in the world today. In, um, I'm not using equality as a political statement or word. I'm using it in the, in the uh, spiritual context. So don't get me wrong. Another thing that, that shows that they are equal is that he was a special handiwork of God. As much as he, Adam was created by God and Eve was not created by an angel. Both of them were created by God. And so we should expect that all of them will come out um, in the same way, with the same quality, with the same essence, with the same um, um, attention to detail that God. In fact, if anything, we can assume that the woman being the apex of God creation, God's creation may have some advantages over the man. The woman may have been created with... A refined material, if we are assuming Adam, Adam, the bones of Adam as a, as a raw material. Eve was refined. But the point is that all of them were created um, from the handiwork of God. And both the man and the woman were created in the image of God. And that is the fundamental basis of, of, of who um, we are. We are all created in the, in the image and likeness of God, both male and female. And on that score, we can conclude that both the man and the woman are equal in terms of their substance and essence. What differs 
from them is their role and their place in creation. We must know, however, that in that first marriage, the man was the first among equals, which made him the leader in the relationship. The man was created first. And according to the law of primogeniture, your place in creation grants you some level of privileges and, and responsibility. For example, in many societies, Firstborn children are given some preferences. They have some unique responsibilities. Expectation of them is, is higher than those that um, um, follows them. And it's the same. Adam was created first before Eve. And so that came with some, some responsibilities and some privileges. And that made him the leader, the head of that family that he met. And so we must come to that understanding. Although the man and the woman are the same in essence, in terms of their standing with God, but in terms of roles and responsibilities, the man was given um, a greater and higher um, responsibility and expectation. And in 1 Corinthians chapter um, 11, verse 3, Paul alludes to this, this um, fact um, he says in verse 3 um, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ the head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God and so each one of them is under some headship Christ is the head of the man the man is the head of the wife and, and God is the head of Christ. And so in terms of their place in creation, the man is given some um, preference and, and some leadership role. I've already referred to the law of primogeniture, which says that the firstborn child received a larger inheritance and with greater responsibility than the other children, not because he or she was preferred or more deserving or better qualified in any way, but merely because she or he was the firstborn. And you can read about this in Genesis chapter 27, um, the relationship with um, Isaac, um, Jacob and Esau and, and all that. However, in the pure state, Adam asserted his leadership. Eve accepted his leadership. Let me say that again. Adam asserted his leadership. Eve accepted his leadership when he gave his bride a name. In Genesis chapter 23. And she shall be called woman because she was taken from man. And therefore, based on this information, a woman who chooses to marry, chooses to submit and subordinate herself in some measure to the leadership of the man of her choice. A lot of the challenges we are experiencing in, in marriages today has to do with you know, past struggles. Who leads the home? Unfortunately, the battle of the sexes is finding its way into the church into the christian home many women are unwilling to submit to their husbands and are claiming equality even in relation to roles and so we must be very careful if you are a woman if you are a christian if you accept christ and his will and his design for, for marriage, you must accept the fact that when you enter a marital covenant with your husband, by implication, you choose to submit to his leadership. You choose to subordinate to him. But this is a choice you have to make. The man must not subjugate you. Submission is a choice. And not by force. And so 
no man should make his business to want to make his wife submit by you know physical abuse or psychological torture that is unacceptable and bringing all these things up so that we begin to go back to basics to know god's design and god's purpose again a woman who chooses to marry in the christian way chooses to submit and subordinate herself in some measure to the leadership of the man of her choice Adam was the head. Eve was the helper. That's how the original marriage was. And that is the, the pattern that we have to, to follow. And this is what um, a certain commentator puts it, Henry, Matthew Henry. He says, she was not made out of his head, referring to the woman. She was not made out of his head to rule over him nor out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal to him, under his arm to be protected, near his heart to be beloved. And that, that is the beautiful way that God designed marriage. Therefore, God designed marriage, as I've already indicated, for companionship, fellowship, procreation, sharing, togetherness. And one last design. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. One purpose of marriage. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses... 22 downwards. And this purpose has to do with sanctification. God designed marriage for both the male and the female to be sanctified. There is a sanctifying effect to pure Christian marriage. Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 26, my point of interest, that he might be sunk he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In other words, Christ or God through his son did everything for the church for Three express reasons. He says, verse 26, that he might sanctify her. In other words, when Christ sacrificially loves the church, us, there is a sanctifying effect. In the same way, when a husband is committed to his covenant relationship with the wife and commits to everything, doing everything for her in a lovingly sacrificial way, there is a sanctifying effect. Now, we all come to marriage with certain needs. Men have needs. Women have needs. Men marry for sexual fulfillment they marry for um, recreational companionship they marry for to be respected they marry to have a, 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 an attractive woman and so when a woman agrees and marries the husband and is committed to meeting these needs many of the traps of the devil that men so easily succumb to and fall 
and fall into is, is, in, is sort of the man becomes protected from it. And so marriage has a sanctifying effect. Sanct sanctification simply means a quality to approach the divine. When a man is in a loving, healthy, functional marriage, it, there is a sanctifying effect on his spirit, his soul, his body. That is same for the wife. Women marry for financial security. They marry for affection. They marry for companionship, conversation. When uh, 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 domestic support... So that there will be a man to help her raise her kids. When a man commits to his wife and loves her and provides for her and protects her and becomes a priest in her home, the woman is also protected from some of the normal traps that women so easily fall into. And that is also, that provides a sanctifying effect for her. Both of them become well-placed for ministry in God's kingdom, for service in God's kingdom. Why? Because they are, without, they are holy and without blemish. Not because inherently they do not have that cap capacity, but the healthiness of their relationship protects them from, from temptations that that affects individuals who are not in a committed relationship. And so God designed marriage, God's plan for marriage is such that there will be companionship, there will be togetherness, there will be fellowship, there will be sharing, and there will be procreation, and there will be sanctification. And that is the purpose. That is God's design for it. Unfortunately, these ideals are changing. It's being replaced by selfish interests. And that is what is giving marriage a bad name. I think marriage is not the problem. It is the corruption and the distortions which have become the problem. We, all, we have also talked about the structure. The man is the head and the woman commits to accept that headship. Again, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, we learn about another design and plan for, for marriage. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. God designed marriage to be between a consenting wife and a consenting husband. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve lived there in God's presence without any relatives. You see, God expects the man to live. I don't think that this is limited to only the man. When, when a man and a woman agrees to enter a covenant of marriage, both of them are expected to live to leave their familial commitment and be joined to one another. Many of us are married and still have pseudo spouses. We, we have not left mentally, emotionally, and physically. We are still connected to certain relationships. Well, again, I don't believe living here is physical. You know, some people marry and even though they do not have the financial resources to rent a huge room, uh, they still think that uh, they should leave. Well, think again. But the point is that the God expects a certain level of independence, financially, emotionally, and spiritually. 
the two of you must leave. Whatever loyalties exist in your life must be terminated to make room for the commitment and loyalty you ought to have for one another. Loyalties to families, to siblings, to systems, to you must leave. And when you leave, you must cleave. You must become so immersed, as we have discussed, like the, the, the Trinity, like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You, you must become integrated into yourself, become permanent fixtures, like two metals welded together. You must become you must cleave. You must be joined together. This also speaks to the permanence of marriage. Marriage was not meant to be an, an experiment where you go and try, you leave and you go and try. It is meant to be permanent. It is meant to be forever. We must live and cleave together. We must become glued together. It says you become one flesh that speaks to the to the consummation the sexual consummation of of the of the marital covenant you look through the old testament marriages or covenant are consummated and ratified by blood genesis 15 17 and all that even god committed himself to that process and so when a man and a woman come together in a covenant of marriage. There is that expectation of a sexual union, a sexual co um, consummation. And that is when the covenant becomes ratified. In other words, God expects some level of oneness, togetherness, to be expressed in marital unions. The first union, Adam and Eve, were together. They were one in the following ways. Together, they sinned. You see, we can blame Adam and Eve for so many things. But as an exemplar for, for marriage, as God designed and intended for it, I think there are certain things we can learn from them. Even though they sinned, they sinned together. Both of them contributed to the sin they committed. And there is something to be said for their sense of unity and togetherness. Together they were punished. Yeah. The man was sentenced. He took it in good faith. The woman was also sentenced. Punished. They were all kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Together they worked. And together they created children. Together they formed a functioning unit. They realized that either one in a sense, in one sense, was not complementary, but together they complemented themselves. Though they were separate with a possibility of independent existence, they committed to mutual existence. Even when they, there was a crisis in their relationship, Adam and Eve had every reason to part ways, but because they understood what God's design for marriage, they stood together. So strong should be the marriage bond that it supersedes the ties between parents and children. So strong must be our commitment to marriage that it supersedes and replaces our bond with our familial um, relationships. If you cannot leave, then you are not ready to cleave. We should not create problems when we are not psychologically and emotionally prepared to, to connect our lives to the lives of others. And so, in Matthew chapter 19, this is Jesus's commentary 
about God's design for marriage. When he was asked about what Moses did in the past, in verse 6, he says, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Marriage is supposed to be a permanent, perpetual, eternal union. Of course, the only exception is in, in situations of adultery or adultery. But even that, many people are making the case that if, if there is grace in the relationship, that can be forgiven. And so God's design for marriage is not to be, uh, 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 to be done in pieces. Where at the least challenge, we look for a way out. That means we have a contract orientation to marriage. We must go back to God's design. So that our marriages would have a firm foundation. Let us begin to discard the modding orientation we have for marriage. It is not helping us in any way. And that is why the rate of divorce is so rampant and escalating, even in the church today. Let us go back to God's design. Let us develop the right attitude that make for that design. And the Lord will bless our marriages and, and will be able to fulfill God's purpose, God's design. We'll be able to procreate, be able to um, share, we'll be able to have a life together, be able to, to sanctify one another. Because the quality of your marriage would make your heavenly journey easier or more difficult and arduous. And so all couples in the church must come together and have a conversation. Are we following God's design? Or oh, we are trying to modernize it. There are certain things that cannot be modernized, particularly in terms of God's design and purpose for it. May God bless us and give, give us the opportunity. I know there are homes that there are regrets about marriage. We, there, there are despondency and despair about marriage. A lot of people are looking for a way out, but Brothers and sisters, there is no way out for us. Yes, we can seek ways of, of reviving our marriages. Let's take that and build a strong marital unit so that we can fulfill God's purpose. See you next week as we continue on the series, The Christian Home.